for the benefit and pleasure of the community. With these words, Helena Kroler Muller spells out the purpose of her art collection in 1925. Her desire is to give everyone the opportunity to become acquainted with the developments in painting that, in her estimation, were important for the future, especially the work of Vincent van Gogh, her personal favourite and the focal point of the collection. During her lifetime she purchases a total of 11,500 objects, including 91 paintings and 175 drawings by van Gogh. The purchases are financed with capital acquired by her husband, Anton Kroler, the director of Willem H. Muller & Co., a company originally owned by Helena's father. Under Anton Kroler's direction, Muller & Co. develops into a powerful international concern with major interests in shipping, the American grain trade and ore mining, especially in North Africa and Spain. The company headquarters is located in The Hague at 1 and 3, the Langer Forat. The idea of starting an art collection comes about when Mrs. Kroler's daughter puts her in touch with H.B. Bremer. Bremer, who promotes himself as an educator in the arts, gives lessons in art appreciation to ladies and gentlemen from the higher circles. Using slides, reproductions and actual works of art, he gives animated lectures on ancient and especially modern art. Helena Kroler is deeply impressed and soon decides to switch from group lessons to private instruction. Bremer now visits her at home every week and even begins to serve as her personal advisor. In the company of the couple, but also frequently at their orders, he visits studios, art shops and auction houses, both within the Netherlands and abroad, searching for work that suits the collection. Mrs. Kroler corresponds almost daily with Sam van Dieventer, her confidant, and tells him of the day's findings. From Paris, she writes, This morning we ventured forth to explore the other Van Goghs again. They were magnificent. Just to mention a few subjects, a basket of apples, so very much like the lemons, more formal perhaps, and more loosely placed, but emerging from the same sentiment. A valley. Imagine roaming through a narrow pass, walking, climbing uphill and down dale, with a murmuring stream constantly running beside you. A stream that sometimes comes to a halt in deeper hollows, sometimes races down a steep decline, and you wander back home, close your eyes, and you can still see that chasm, that stream, the blooming banks, and everything woven higgledy-piggledy into a joyous, colourful carpet. But most beautiful is an olive grove, so soft and intimate, and such a completely great painting. The collection builds at high speed. After a few years, the Krollers own the largest private Van Gogh collection in the world. In 1913, the first floor of the company's headquarters on the Langer Forout is turned into a museum. Visits are made by appointment. In the various rooms, the visitor becomes acquainted with a splendid collection of paintings and drawings, as well as with Mrs. Kroler's own views of art and art history. Her views are expressed in her book, Discussion of Problems in the Development of Modern Art, published privately in 1925. Here she identifies two directions in the development of modern art, realism and idealism. Both directions, she believes, are based on observed reality. The artists whom she considers realists concentrate mainly on observation, use of light, the depiction of material and the effects of colour and perspective. The artists she considers idealists sometimes abstract their forms. They tend to convey the image of their idea of reality. Of all the moderns, it is mainly the Cubist that she openly admires. She buys paintings by Pablo Picasso and Juan Ruiz and defends the new school with great enthusiasm.
She also has great admiration for the early work of Piet Mondrian. Writing about his composition in line from 1917, she says she regards it as cubist art in his purest form, and that she hopes people will one day recognize the value of this work for the development of art. Yet Elena Kroner-Muller, who enjoys her newly acquired status as a collector, has one more dream in mind, a large museum with an adjoining private residence. Designs are submitted by several architects, including Beta Behrens and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. So they can judge the designs properly, the Krollers have full-scale models built in wood and painted canvas at the desired location. Mrs. Kroller is not convinced and turns her attention to the Veilure, a wooded area in the eastern Netherlands where the family already owns a small farm with extensive hunting grounds. The possibility of combining nature and culture is something that appeals to Mrs. Kroller. She approaches the architect H.P. Berlager with a new commission. Berlager is employed by the firm and begins submitting designs. One of them is for the St. Hubert Hunting Lodge. Financially, it seems overly ambitious for the time. The house is built and furnished according to plan, down to the smallest details. Matters of comfort and technology are given full attention. A central vacuum cleaning system is installed in the lower rooms, and one of the first passenger lifts in the Netherlands goes up to the room in the tower. While at work on this project, Berlager drafts a design for the museum building. But before construction can start on his impressive plan, the collaboration between him and the Krollers breaks down. Berlager's departure does not keep Mrs. Kroller from realizing her dream. She invites Henry van der Felder to carry on with the project. The Belgian architect works almost six years on a new design for the Great Museum, after which the laying of the foundations finally commences. Custom-cut stones are brought in on a specially constructed railway line. Van der Felder, who is an artist and an experienced instructor, as well as an architect, assumes the role of advisor for the collection. He suggests that Mrs. Kroller purchase Le Chau by Georges Surat, which in his eyes is a first-rate work. Le Chau would be her last major purchase. In that same year, 1922, H.P. Bremer receives a letter in which Mrs. Kroller informs him that due to financial circumstances, no further art purchases can be made. The reason is the international economic recession, in which the firm of Willem H. Muller & Co. is also hard hit. The company suffers heavy losses, and the building of the Great Museum must be halted to Mrs. Kroller's great distress. Although the company's problems mount, she remains optimistic about the possibility of carrying on. A considerable portion of the necessary material, Marlbrunn sandstone, is already at the site. All the drawings for this monumental building have been completed down to the smallest detail. All the necessary specifications have been made, many samples have been selected. All we're waiting for is the signal to start building. But the building is never resumed. The recession continues, eventually endangering even the couple's country estate as well as the art collection. To keep the collection together and safeguard it from the vicissitudes of the economy, the Kroner Mullers present the art collection to the Dutch state on the condition that an appropriate museum be built to house it. The estate is placed under the protection of a separate foundation, known today as the Hukefelua National Park. But even the government finds it impossible to realise the ambitious plans. Finally, a decision is made to build a smaller and cheaper transitional museum. Henry van der Velde will design it. According to the plan, it will eventually be replaced by a large museum. Helena Kroll & Muller opens the museum in 1938 and serves as its first director. One year later, at age 70, she dies. The death of Anton Kroll follows two years later, in December 1941. 
the couple lie buried on the French Hill near the site that Helena Kroler Muller had chosen for her great museum. After the Second World War, it becomes clear that Helena Kroler Muller's dream will never be realized. The Transitional Museum is renamed the Rijksmuseum Kroler Muller. In 1953, under the direction of Dr. A. M. Harmacher, a Congress wing and a large hall are added to the museum. It's Professor Harmacher's wish to make sculpture the museum's second new speciality. He needs the large hall to display the sculptures. Once again, Henry van der Velde is called in to design the addition. Unlike Mrs. Kroler, Harmacher expressly asks van der Velde to create a space that is open and light with large windows, thereby establishing an obvious relationship with the natural world outside. Harmacher wants to take full advantage of the play of light in order to show museum visitors all the facets of the sculptures, many of which are large or painted. Harmacher dreams of a sculpture garden directly behind the building, a garden featuring sculptures from Rodin to the present day. In 1961, the sculpture garden becomes a reality. Works of art are arranged on grassy lawns with walls of foliage, each with its own ambience, as if they were rooms in a museum. Relationships are carefully sought between the sculptures themselves and between the sculptures and their immediate surroundings. Then nature takes over. Every season and every hour of the day brings different colours and lighting effects constantly surprising the visitor with a marvellous interplay of the sculptures and the natural space around them. Three years later, the Riet Felt Pavilion is added to the sculpture garden, a reconstruction of a pavilion that architect Gerrit Rietveld designed in 1955 for the open-air exhibition in Arnhem's Sonsbeek Park. This small building was intended for displaying sculptures out of doors and its special use of space places it somewhere between architecture and sculpture. In 1965, under the directorate of Rudi Oxener, the Transitional Museum is ready for a thorough renovation. The building is seriously lacking in technical facilities it is also undersized and fails to satisfy any of the requirements of a modern museum. The Dutch architect Wim Quist is commissioned to design a new addition. Light and space, art and nature are the key words from which an unprecedented new museum concept emerges. The entrance to the museum is moved Despite the striking differences in floor plan, structure and character, the two buildings do form a new whole with a wealth of possibilities for displaying and experiencing art and architecture in relation to each other. The combination of nature, architecture and an advanced exhibition policy has focused the world's attention on the museum in Otolo. At the end of the 60s, indications emerging from the art world suggest that nature and art can be of significance to each other in yet another way. The scenic function served by the sculpture garden up until then, the idea of rooms in the open air, no longer corresponds with the view of a new generation of artists who are searching for ways to dialogue with nature while still making use of the qualities of the sculpture garden. Concepts such as movement, change, time and individual place become the artist's field of exploration. The area surrounding the sculpture assumes an important role right from the idea phase, making it a vital part of the work itself. To give these artists enough room, both literally and figuratively, large areas of woodland are twice added to the sculpture garden. The terrain is deliberately cultivated as little as possible. The result is a new adventure for the museum, the artist and the visitor.
the works of art that now emerge are spread out over the entire terrain. One is right out in the open, another is secluded in a remote corner of the garden or hidden among the rhododendrons. They are inextricably bound up with their location in the sculpture garden and can only be properly experienced as part of their surroundings. In 1990 the sculpture garden is 30 years old and ready for renovation, but it's also ready for a look into the future. Director Evert van Straten, working with West Aid Landscape Architects, develops a long-range plan. The original design is once again more strongly accented and made to form a harmonic whole with the later expansions. New artists are carefully introduced, often bringing what for us are a wealth of lesser-known cultures. It's a policy that conforms perfectly with the history of the museum. At the back of the sculpture garden, in a carefully considered location, is the sculpture pavilion designed by the Dutch architect Aldo von Eyck, acquired in 2005. Like the Rietveld pavilion mentioned earlier, this is also a reconstruction. Twelve years after Rietveld, Aldo van Eyck designed this pavilion for the 1966 sculpture exhibition in Sonsbeek Park and for the same place. With its intimacy and contrast with the surrounding natural setting, it has a spatial effect and functionality that is entirely different from that of the Rietveld Pavilion. With its sculpture garden, both lively and contemplative, with the Kvist wing for presentations and new acquisitions of contemporary sculpture, and with the museum building designed by Henry van der Felter, the treasury of Mr. and Mrs. Kroner Müller's collection, where the history all began, the museum is open for visitors. It's a unique experience of architecture, art and nature for young and old, alone or in groups, from the Netherlands and beyond. <laughs>